The June solstice brings these short, bright summer nights to the northern hemisphere, but there's a silver lining in the beautiful noctilucent clouds. We're also entering the peak of Milky Way core season, and it's the last chance for those of you in the northern hemisphere to get a Milky Way summer arch. And there's also lots of moon and planet opportunities this month as well. Welcome back to another episode of What's in the Night Sky for June 2023. And as we approach the June solstice, those of you in the Northern Hemisphere might be a little bit discouraged by the short, bright summer nights. But there is a silver lining, which we'll get into shortly. So the solstice falls on the 21st this month, and it brings the longest night of the year for those in the Southern Hemisphere, but the shortest night of the year for those in the Northern Hemisphere. And if you're northward of about 50 degrees north in latitude, you won't get to experience a proper nighttime for the next two months because the sun doesn't get far enough below the horizon. So when the sun is between naught and minus six degrees below the horizon, we experience the period of civil twilight, between minus 6 and minus 12 degrees is nautical twilight, and between minus 12 and minus 18 degrees is astronomical twilight. Once the sun dips below 18 degrees, that's when it's officially nighttime and the sun's light is no longer present in the skies above. And so for those of you that are around 50 degrees north in latitude, the skies will only get as dark as astronomical twilight this month, which isn't too bad. You can still see pretty much all the stars and you can actually get fairly decent detail out of the Milky Way. But for those of you that are around 55 degrees north, you will only experience nautical twilight this month. And so you'll only see the brightest stars and not get very much detail out of the Milky Way at all. And then if you're around 60 degrees north in latitude, you only get as dark as civil twilight for the next couple of months. So not much to be had in terms of traditional astrophotography, but there is a silver lining almost quite literally in the noctilucent clouds. So noctilucent clouds are the highest known clouds to exist. They form at an altitude of 85 kilometers, which puts them in the layer of Earth's atmosphere known as the mesosphere. And they're formed out of ice, and quite counterintuitively, during the summer months is when the mesosphere is at its coldest, and it's cold enough for these clouds to form. And they form over the polar regions, so at this time of year, over the North Pole. Now they're practically invisible to the naked eye in most situations, but around this time of year, they get illuminated from the underneath by the sun, which is below the horizon, and then they glow against the dark backdrop of twilight for those of you between sort of 45 and 60 degrees north in latitude. They can truly be a magnificent sight. They have a silvery blue color to them and they really do glow against that backdrop of twilight and they just ebb and flow and they're so beautiful to watch. And so the best seen from latitude is between 50 and 60 or 50 and 65 degrees north. But in recent years, they've been new records and they've been spotted as far south as 30 36 degrees north. I won't talk much more about these clouds because I have an entire video dedicated to these, so go and check that out if you haven't already. I'll put a link in the video description down below. Or you can read more about them in my book, Photographing the Night Sky. It's a 570 page encyclopedic guide to everything you need to know about landscape astrophotography. Now, for those of you that still have dark skies, I'm sure you'd be interested to know what's going on with the Milky Way this month because we are heading into the peak of Milky Way core season where the Milky Way core is visible all night long. So starting in the Northern Hemisphere as darkness falls, the Milky Way core can be found in the Southeast with the Great Rift, Cygnus region and Cassiopeia region arching over the East into the Northeast. This will be your last opportunity for the year to grab a summer Milky Way arch panorama as next month the arch will be almost overhead as darkness falls and if you try to do a panorama, there will be heavy warping on the top edge of the frame and it just doesn't make for a very good photograph. As the light goes on, the Milky Way core arches across the southern horizon and into the southwest before the morning twilight starts to kick in. The height the core reaches above the horizon as it crosses the south will depend on your latitude, so the closer you are to the equator, the higher it will reach. In the southern hemisphere, the Milky Way core can be found in the east as darkness falls, and after it has climbed a little bit higher, there's a good opportunity for a Milky Way arch panorama facing southeast. And as the night goes on, the Milky Way core will climb higher and higher into the sky and passes practically overhead depending on your latitude 
and this can make landscape astrophotography quite difficult, although the Great Rift of the Milky Way will be standing vertically on the northern horizon. Then from 2am onwards, the Milky Way core will begin sinking towards the western horizon, presenting another opportunity for a Milky Way arch panorama, this time facing more westerly. The core continues to sink down to the western horizon, and the Milky Way band lies almost parallel with the horizon just before the morning twilight kicks in and fades it from view. Now if you want to photograph the Milky Way this month, the best time is when the moon is not in the sky, so the week before and after new moon is good, and new moon this month is on the 18th. Full moon is on the 4th, and it's known as the strawberry moon in Native American cultures because it occurs around the time of the strawberry harvest, but in Europe it's known as the honey or mead moon. As for the planets this month, Mars and Venus can be found in the western evening skies. The red planet shines at a modest apparent magnitude of plus 1.6, but Venus, the brightest natural object in the sky after the moon, brightens over the course of the month from minus 4.4 to minus 4.7. And as the month goes by, Venus climbs higher and higher into the sky, and the two planets get closer and closer until they come to conjunction on July the 1st, where they will be incredibly close to one another in the western evening skies. But long before we even get to the conjunction, a couple of other dates you should note, as at the start of June from the 1st to the 4th is when Mars buzzes its way through the Beehive Cluster, and then roughly 10 days later between the 12th and the 14th, Venus also skims through it as well. Saturn rises in the early hours of the morning and can be found under the Milky Way arch moving slowly into the constellation Aquarius. Then in the morning twilight you'll find Jupiter shining at a bright minus 2.2, shortly followed by Mercury shining at minus 0.6. But as the month goes on, Mercury heads closer and closer to the Sun and is lost from view. As for the moon and planet close approaches this month, a thin crescent moon can be found right next to Jupiter on the morning of the 14th. This is a really nice photographic opportunity. And then on the 21st and the 22nd, a thin crescent moon passes by Mars and Venus in the western evening skies. Again, another really good photographic opportunity. And that's all I've got for you this month, guys. Now onto the hashtag Wittens. For those of you that are new here, every month I set a target subject or theme for people to photograph and then upload your images to Instagram using the hashtag Wittens, and I pick my favorite three for a prize. Third place wins a copy of my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets. Second place wins a Constellation hoodie. And first place wins a copy of my book, Photographing the Night Sky. Last month's theme was Milky Way arch panoramas, and there were so many amazing entries, but in third place, was NC Shutterbuzz with this image from Lake Tyrell Salt Lake. And what I really loved about this image was the perfect white balance setting. So you've got really nice separated colors with the green air glow as well as the red air glow and a nice rusty orange color to the Milky Way core. And I love the foreground interest too. So you have this person light painting this abandoned bus and the bus just feels so small compared to the grand nature of the Milky Way. In second place was Ranit D. Holy with this image from the Himalayan mountain range. And I love the way that the path in the foreground just mirrors the arch of the Milky Way. I love the person in the foreground just adding that sense of scale and adventure to the image. And also the way that the path sort of leads you to the other main subject of the image, which is that little mountain there. And there was just a really nice, soft, ethereal, dreamlike edit to this image, which I really loved. And in first place was Alexandre Croissier, and they submitted multiple images which I really wanted to select. So two of these were very urban environments, and I always like to give bonus points for urban astrophotography in Wittens. And they were both just composed really, really well. And then there was another image from a more rural environment at Pointe de Ben here, with this incredible rocky mountainous landscape, the Milky Way arching over a central spiky rock feature, and a nice view down to the sea where the Milky Way core is. And I just love the way this panorama was composed. This month, seeming some of you will not have access to dark skies, let's go with twilight. So anything with the theme of twilight. It could be the moon, planets, could be star trails, faint Milky Way, 
or just the gradient of twilight itself. So anything to do with twilight. Anyway, thanks for tuning in to another episode of What's in the Night Sky. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. And if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies. Oh,